The following is a presentation of Chandler Christian Church in Chandler, Arizona. For more information, please go to chandlercc.org. Well, inside that your chest is a little nine-ounce muscle uh, that's called the heart. Little nine-ounce thing. It's an amazing piece of work. This little muscle sends to your lungs oxygen-starved blood where it's then recharged with O2 and then pumped to every cell of your body. It, 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 uh, your, your heart enables your body to maintain its body temperature. Your heart uh, sends uh, fuel to your brain so you have the ability to think. It's an amazing creation, the heart. Uh, it pumps about two ounces of blood through your system per beat or about five quarts of blood through your body per minute unless you're exerting yourself, and then it can pump between 20 to 30 gallons or quarts of of blood through your body uh, per minute. If you calculate that out over a year's period of time, that's 648,000 gallons of blood that your heart pumps every year. If you live to be 75 years of age, then your heart pumps uh, 48 million, 600,000 gallons of blood through your body through this amazing little muscle that you have inside of your chest right now that we hope beats continually throughout the rest of this service. Um, (laughs) It beats on average of about 70 times per minute, unless you're exercising. It beats 100,800 beats per day. Uh, Over a year, that's 36,792,000 beats. That is, if you live to be 75, and if you live to be 75, that's about 2.76 billion beats from this little amazing muscle that's inside of your chest that beats. And if you do these figures, like I did, and determine how many times my heart has beat thus far in my life, it's beat about 2.14 billion beats. That means I'm well past the halfway point, and that's a little discouraging. Now, in doing these uh, figures, um, I recognize how important it is for us to realize what the heart is all about. Because if we assume that we'll live to be 75 years of age, these facts are true. But oftentimes things go wrong. Oftentimes your heart gets diseased or sick and gets weak. It can grow tired and it affects your heart. In fact, heart attack is the number one killer in the United States for both men and women. Over 50% of the people who die in the U.S. this year will die from heart failure. That's why your heart is so important. That's why it's so important to take good care of it. And the Bible talks a lot about the heart too, but it doesn't talk about the blood pumper. It talks about that which makes up your character, that which nourishes your soul. That is what you are under your skin. It speaks of the heart in a spiritual way. In fact, the Old Testament, the word heart is referred to 596 times. In the New Testament, the word heart is referred to 161 times. That means in the Bible, there are 757 references to your heart. That's how important it is. And in our chapter that we're reading through his story today, seven times Jesus refers to the heart. That's why it's so important for us to pay attention to it. Not the blood pumper, yes, but the spiritual heart. In fact, Solomon years ago said it this way in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23. Read aloud with me, would you? It's on the screen. Let's read it together. Here we go. Above all else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. That is, it is the source of life. It's the energy of your life. You've got to guard your heart. So it's no oddity as Jesus begins to train his 12 disciples and all of his disciples at the beginning of the chapter, chapter 7, that he begins with the heart of the matter. Because what really matters is the heart. And so Jesus, as he's training his people, wants us to focus on the heart of the matter. And so as we begin chapter 7, we see that Jesus is again traveling. He's in the region that we call the Galilee. Just to remind you of our geography, this is the Dead Sea. If you go halfway between the Dead Sea and the Mediterranean Sea, you hit the city of Jerusalem, which is primary in Jesus' life. But most of his ministry is carried out up in this region called the Galilee. This is Samaria, and this is the Galilee. And Jesus is traveling around through this region called the Galilee, and he's healing people, and he's a teaching. And wherever Jesus goes, he's got this little posse that travels with him. His closest followers, the disciples, or we call later the apostles, and a large crowd of people that travel with him. And there are always Pharisees. These are teachers of the law that are strict Jewish legalists who are following and traveling around with Jesus. 
Jesus. And they're always trying to catch Jesus and his disciples doing something wrong so that they can persecute them, so that they can uh, get them into trouble. And one day, Jesus is traveling up in this region with his disciples, and they're hungry, so they stop at an In-N-Out burger uh, to get something to eat. And glad to see you're awake, okay? Notice they didn't get cheese on their burger because that wouldn't be kosher. And so uh, they got their, their hamburgers, and they're, they're getting ready to eat. And so they're really hungry, so they just rip open the bag, and they start eating their food. And, and when they did, the Pharisees who were watching them said, oh, your guys didn't wash their hands like they're supposed to wash their hands. Now, now, God expects cleanliness. Much of the law in the Old Testament is based on a hygiene. But the fact is that these people had taken the law about cleanliness and, and taken it to a new level. They said they put a fence around the Old Testament law. And they prescribed how you should wash your hands. And if you didn't wash your hands in the way they taught in their tradition, then they considered you a sinner. Even though you weren't breaking the Old Testament law, you were breaking their man-made rules. And these rules were strict. They said if you have dust on your hands or dirt, you have to wipe it off. And then you take a cup with water in it, pure water, and you pour it over this hand. Let it run down your elbows because you don't want that water to run back because it would defile your hand after you've cleaned it. And then you take that cup in this other hand. You do the same thing over here. But the cup was clean because you you touched it with your dirty hand, so you got to wash the cup then, and then you pour it over. And they had this whole system of how you were to wash before you start to eat. They had a system of how you are to wash your cups, how you wash your pots and pans. And they were criticizing the disciples because they didn't wash according to the traditions of men. And Jesus is disgusted with them, and he jumps down their throats because he's just about had it with them. And he calls them, you hypocrites. Now, I think you know what the word hypocrite means, but just to remind you, a hypocrite is the term for an actor in a play, originated with the Greeks, and a hypocrite is one who pretends, one who puts on a show or acts out something that he is not. In other words, they're faking it. They're not real. They show it on the outside, but it's not on the inside. And Jesus said to them on page 100 of his story, or Mark chapter 7, verse 6, Isaiah prophesied correctly about you hypocrites, as it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their what? Their what? Their hearts are far from me. He said, you people talk a good game, but you don't live it out. I mean, for instance, you say that the Bible says that we are to honor our father and mother. This is the first command with a promise. But when your parents come to you and say, we need some financial help, you say, oh, mom and dad, I can't give you any money because my money is dedicated to God. It's Corbin. It's all dedicated to God, so I can't give you anything. you got to make it on your own. Jesus said, you're making a mockery of what God's intent was and what God's desire are. In page 101, or Mark, Mark chapter 7, verse 13, Jesus said, thus you nullify the word of God by your tradition that you've handed down. And you do many things like this. For instance, Jesus said, you eat, uh, you, you like the foods you eat and won't eat. You think that if you won't eat the restricted foods, if you do eat them, that you will be a sinner, that you are defiled. But it isn't the food that defiles a person. It's the heart of the matter. That's what leads to a person being defiled. It's not from the outside. It's from the inside. In fact, Jesus said on page 101 or Matthew chapter 15, Don't you understand that whatever goes into the mouth enters the stomach and then passes out into the sewer? That's a nice way to say that, isn't it? But Jesus said, But the things that come out of the mouth... Come from the what? Heart. And these things defile a person. For out of the heart come evil ideas, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. These are the things that defile a person. Not eating with unwashed hands that defiles a person. Jesus is trying to teach his followers what the heart of his followers should mirror. What the heart of his followers should look like and be like. You see, in a modern context, Jesus might say it this way. Look, I, I know you go to church almost every weekend. And I know that you bring your Bible with you. And I know that you've read your chapter of the His story. Held it up. I know you're wearing your witness bracelets as you go around. And, and I know uh, that, you, uh, uh, that you give 10% a tithe in the offerings. And I know that you've committed and you're giving that $1 extra into the dollar club each week. And I know that you've attended all of the three C seminars. But all of these are on the outside. What's in your heart? So you can do all this stuff on the outside. 
You can, you can complete all the rules and tick every box off. But it doesn't make any difference if it's not happening in your heart. It's about the heart of the matter. I mean, look at this list that Jesus gives again. Jesus said it's really from the heart that evil ideas come from. What are evil ideas? Well, you know you're thinking about them right now. They're different for every one of us. Maybe that sarcastic thing or that thing that you think about or, or what you know doesn't honor God when it comes into your thought process. That doesn't come from the outside. That comes from the inside. It comes from the heart, Jesus said. Or, or murder. Remember Jesus earlier said, you know, the Bible says, thou shalt not murder. But I tell you that if you are so angry with someone that you say, I could just kill them. You've already murdered them in your heart. What about adultery? Adultery is a sexual relationship outside of the bounds of marriage with someone other than your spouse. And whether it be a physical act with someone or whether it be an act of watching someone on the uh, two-dimensional computer screen, if you are abusing that relationship, you are in adultery. Jesus said it this way. He said, you've heard that it's written, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say to you, that anyone who looks at something and lusts after them has already committed adultery with them in their heart. It's all about the heart. Or, or, sexual, or sexual immorality. You say, well, I'm not married. I'm covered, right? No. If you're involved in a sexual relationship with someone outside of marriage, then the Bible says that that's evil and it comes from an evil heart. It's a heart problem because you know God's passion and God's desire is that one sexual relationship be with one man, one woman in marriage and for one lifetime. That's God's passion. And outside of that, it's from an evil heart or theft. If you're, if you're not giving an honest day's work for an honest day's wage... If you're taking office supplies or if you're fudging a little bit on your income taxes, then you're stealing. And that doesn't come from the outside. That comes from an evil heart. Or, or um, false testimony. Telling a lie. Misleading someone from the truth. Yeah, but i got to get that contract signed. That, that doesn't come from the outside. It comes from the inside, an evil heart. Or, or slander. You know, slanders. We live in a world today where everybody's sarcastic. Have you noticed that? You watch every television program, and it seems like everybody's putting somebody else down to make themselves feel better about themselves. And people are caustic and, and satirical and critical of other people. And whether it's just uh, car sarcasm or, or uh, gossip, you could even call it a prayer request. <laughs> Jesus said it comes from an evil heart. It's all about the heart, Jesus said. You see, the religion people, religious people of Jesus' day were focused on the outside. They were focused on the rules and the regulations, the do's and the don'ts, the thou shalts and the thou shalt nots, that they missed the point. They missed the heart of the matter. And then Jesus comes along with his followers and he says, listen, an authentic walk with God begins from the inside out. Not the outside in. It begins in the heart. It's not about keeping all the rules and regulations. It's not about following the traditions of man. It's not from the outside in. It's from the inside out. It begins with the heart. So in our chapter, we find Jesus traveling again. And he goes from this region that we call the Galilee up to this region that's called Tyre and Sidon. It's um, a region of the Syrophoenician people. It's not where Jewish people typically live. Uh, there are some up there, of course, but, but traditionally that is a, an area that is made up of Greek people. And one day Jesus went up there. That's the only time in scriptures we record that he did. And uh, while he was there, a woman, a Syrophoenician woman, not even a Jewish person, who didn't know the Jewish principles of the law, the traditions, she came to Jesus because she had a need. Her daughter was filled with a demon, and she'd heard that Jesus could cast demons out. So this woman came to where Jesus was, and she begged with him and pleaded with him to cast the demon out of her daughter. And Jesus' response seemed so out of character for him. Jesus looked at this woman, and she said, he said, Woman, don't you know that I've come to bring the bread of life to the lost sheep of Israel? 
I, I've not come to cast the bread of God and give it to dogs. He's calling her a dog. And the woman's statement back to Jesus is just priceless. She so said, yes, Lord, but even the dogs get to lick up the crumbs that fall underneath the children's table. And I just see Jesus stepping back with a smile on his face. And he said to her on page 102 or Matthew 15, Woman, your faith is great. Because you said this, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. And she went home and found that the child was lying on the bed and the demon gone. Now this is a heart of faith. This is a heart of faith. And that's what Jesus wants them to understand. That's what Jesus wants all of us to understand. Now, I ask the question, why did Jesus go up there? There's no other record of him going. And there's nothing else that we see that Jesus did while he was there except come in contact with this woman. So why did he go up there? And why did this take place? And the answer is to teach them that it's not about the rules and regulations. This woman didn't know what the rules and regulations were. She wasn't Jewish. She was a Syrophoenician woman. She didn't know all the teachings of Moses. She didn't know the principles of the law and the prophets. What she did know is that she needed help. And there was only one person that she knew who could help her. And it was Jesus. And she came to him with a heart of faith. It's all about the heart. So Jesus goes back through the region of Galilee... Uh, from the Tyre Phoenician woman's area, Sidon. And he comes back through the Galilee and he goes into this region called the Decapolis or the Ten Cities region. This is the same region where Jesus uh, healed the demoniacs that were living in the tombs and cast their demons into the pigs. You remember we talked about that uh, suicide a couple of weeks ago? And so uh, this is that same region. And when Jesus goes into that region, they bring him a man who is deaf and unable to speak clearly. And Jesus does this marvelous miracle, and you read about it, and, and, uh, and, uh, and he heals this man. And the people respond, oh, this Jesus, he has done everything well. And the disciples are watching this. So he goes back to Galilee, and, and when he goes there, many people are brought to him. And he heals the sick and makes the lame walk again. And he teaches and he heals and he teaches and he teaches and heals and he heals and teaches and he teaches and heals and he heals and teaches and he teaches and he heals and he teaches and he heals and he heals and teaches. You getting this? And, and he's doing it for three days. He's healing people. They're bringing him and he's healing them and he's teaching them. And after three days, the people hadn't had anything to eat. Now, you understand, in this day and time, they didn't have well-stocked pantries like we have or refrigerators or freezers where we could live for a month and never go to the store again. Uh, these people lived hand-to-mouth, day by day. And so they may have brought something with them to eat, but quickly it had run out and there was nothing left. And the Bible said Jesus had compassion on him. Splachninomai is the Greek word. His stomach was upset because he saw them in their pain. And he said, these people have nothing to eat. Uh, we've got to send them home. And his disciples said, they can't send them home. Some of them won't make it. They're going to starve before they get home. And so Jesus said, what do we got? And so they went through the crowd and they found that there were seven loaves of bread. That's it, just seven little loaves of bread and a huge crowd. And a few fish. And so Jesus said, all right, you, you tell the people to sit down in groups. And why is this important? Because he wanted to know how many people were there. Comes an important point later. And he, he gets the seven loaves. And I think he probably uh, asked to borrow a basket. And he put the seven loaves in the basket and the fish in the little basket. And then he prays over them. And he says to his disciples, come on up here and distribute the food. And they're thinking, well, this won't take long. You know, 4,000 people, seven loaves. And so, Peter, come on, you're number one. He comes up. He says, hold your robe out. He puts up the robe. Jesus reaches the basket and drops the seven loaves in and some of the fish and then sends him off. And he said, now next. And they're thinking, well, there's nothing left in there. And Jesus reaches in again and hands a double handful out and some of the fish. And he sends it out and he goes out. They work through all 12 of them and they come back again. And he's got more. And they come back and he got more. And he got and come back and he got more. And he feeds them. And the Bible says that he fed them until they were all satisfied. Chorizo is the word. It means uh, to be filled to the brim and beyond. It means uh, like the surface tension glass, it's, it's being filled so much you can't take anymore. You know how you feel after you eat on Thanksgiving Day? 
You know, when you have to unbutton or hope you have your stretchy pants on. And, and, and so he said, this, these people were just stuffed to the gills. They couldn't eat any more. And Jesus said, well, let's be good ecologists here. Let's go out and collect the leftovers. And so his disciples go out and collect the leftovers. And they come back with seven baskets full of bread. How many loaves did they start with? How many basketfuls? Wouldn't you think they'd get this? Wouldn't you think his disciples would understand what he's talking about when he's talking about a heart of faith, that it's a heart matter? But they didn't. And what happens next, honestly, would be funny if it wasn't so sad. Jesus says to his guys, let's get in the boat. They're going, no, no, not the boat again, not the boat again. Let's get in the boat and go across the sea. And while they got in the boat, they were out for a little while, and one of the disciples said, you know, it's going to take us a couple hours to get across the sea. Did anybody bring anything to eat? And one of the guys said, I thought you were supposed to get the box lunches. No, I, I thought you were going to get the box lunches. No, I, well, what do we got here? And they start scrounging around, and one of the guys said, well, I grabbed one of the loaves out of one of the baskets when I came on board, but that's all we got, one loaf of bread. So the disciples are arguing about this. Jesus steps up and he says, guys, let me tell you, you need to beware of the yeast of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. Jesus was trying to help them understand uh, that they have to be careful. You know what yeast does when you're making bread? That yeast bubbles up and, and its gas permeates through the loaf of bread and affects every molecule of the bread. And Jesus said, listen, you've got to be careful of the teaching of these principles of the law who are teaching that it's all about the outside of your walk. Jesus is warning them about an inauthentic walk, a faith that's based on the outside, what you do on the outside, not a faith of the heart. And that's what Jesus has come to teach, a faith of the heart. But as they listen to Jesus teach, they think that he's upset because they only have one loaf of bread in the boat. And Jesus finds this incredulous. What? You think I'm talking about bread? On page 104, 105, or Matthew 16, or Mark 8, when Jesus learned of this, he said, You have such little faith. What are you arguing about? No bread. Don't you see or understand? Have your hearts been hardened? Though you have eyes, don't you see? Though you have ears, don't you hear? Don't you remember? I mean, a couple of months ago, when I, when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, and how many basketfuls did you have left over? Twelve. Don't you remember just the day before yesterday when all those people gathered and there's nothing to eat? And, and I said, how many loaves you got? And they said, we have seven. And I passed them out and everybody was chorizo. They were filled to the brim. And how many basketfuls did you have left over? Seven. Did you guys miss this? Jesus said. And then he said to them, Do you still not understand? Man, that Jesus can ask some piercing questions, can't he? Do we still not understand? And they just couldn't grasp the fact that Jesus was trying to do heart surgery on them. They were still trapped in a religion that's based on the outside. They couldn't grasp what Jesus wanted them to see that if you change the heart, you change the action. It's not about the outside. It's about what goes on inside. If you change the heart, you change the actions. If you change the inside, the outside follows that change. Well, Jesus took his disciples to a region called Caesarea Philippi. It's north of the Sea of Galilee a little ways. It's right at the base of Mount Hermon. And Mount Hermon rises 12,000 feet up elevation. So it's a little bit like the mountains around Arizona. The snow gets in there, and then when it begins to melt, the water runs down. And that's what feeds the headwater of the Jordan River and the Sea of Galilee and, and the rest of the Jordan River down to the Dead Sea. It's the primary water source for Israel. And it's a beautiful place. As the snow begins to melt, it greens up, and it's elaborate. It's lush. It's glorious. In fact, i got a picture here we took on one of our trips. This is what it looks like up in that region as the water comes down. It's a cool 
uh, mountain stream water, and it's lush in that area. And it was so nice up there that the Greeks and then the Romans built mansions up there, uh, getaway homes. We call them mountain homes. And they, they built them because they could go in the heat of the summer, and it would be cool because the cool mountain water would cool them down, and the leaves and the trees were there. And they had elaborate villas that they built there. And because they were Roman and they were Greek, they brought their Greek gods to worship in that location. In fact, on the sides of the cliffs all over, you can see these niches where they've created these niches to place their pagan gods into. And they're all over the sides of the mountain. You can see another picture here where you can see a number of the other. uh, They're all over there. You can still see those niches where they put their pagan gods. And you might be asking yourself, well, why did Jesus bring his guys up there? And well, first of all, for a little R&R, it's a great place to go in the heat of the summer. But even more than that, Jesus had a point that he wanted to make to them. So in the midst of all of these representations of the pagan gods, Jesus asked them on page 105 or Luke 9, Matthew 16, Who do people say the Son of Man is? And they answered, John the Baptist. Others say Elijah. Still others say that one of the prophets this long ago risen back to life again. But he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered. Read out loud with me, would you? You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And there it is. The very heart of the matter. Jesus is God in the flesh. That's where it all begins with understanding the heart of the matter. Jesus is God in the flesh. This is what they had to understand. This is what we must understand and grasp and commit ourselves to because before we can change our hearts, we have to surrender our hearts to another master. Before we can have that heart change, that heart surgery, we, we have to surrender our hearts to another king. And by this statement, the heart surgery begins. And then Jesus pulls out all the stops and he says, let me, let me tell you what your decision means. I mean, if you really mean that, that I'm the Christ, the Son of the living God, let me, let me tell you what it will cost you if you decide to have this heart surgery. On page 106 or Luke 9, Jesus said, If anyone wants to become my follower, he must deny himself and take up his cross. you got to die to yourself. How often? Daily. Daily. And follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel will save it. For what does it benefit a person if he gains the whole world but forfeits his own life and soul. It's not about your pleasure. It's not about your comfort. Are you willing to die for me that I might live in you? See, Jesus says to follow me, to follow Jesus demands our whole heart. It demands our whole heart. And then as if to cap this all off, eight days later, Jesus took his disciples to the foot of what we assume to be Mount Tabor, just south of the Sea of Galilee. And he invites Peter, James, and John to go up on top of the mountain and pray with him. The rest of the disciples stayed below. And Jesus and these three went up to the top of the mountain, and Jesus began to pray. Now, what did his disciples do whenever Jesus went off to pray? They fell asleep. Over and over again, you'll find it. that Jesus is praying, and they're sound asleep, you know. So Jesus is up there praying, and the three of these guys fall fast asleep. And while that happened, the Bible says that Jesus was transfigured. Literally, his form changed. He took on a heavenly form. It began to glow. And, and while Jesus was doing that, it's, it's, a, it's a transformation. Like, beam me up, Scotty. You know, it's like it's transformation. And while he was there, Moses and Elijah appear to him, and they're having a conversation. And it's during this conversation that Peter wakes up. And he looks over to see where Jesus is, and he sees Jesus in this transfigured state, glowing, talking to Moses, the author of the law, and Elijah, the chief of the prophets. 
Now, I've often wondered how he knew it was Moses and how he was, knew it was Elijah. And I've got it figured out. They had name tags on. <laughs> Why not, you know? Or maybe, maybe Elijah was standing in the flaming chariot and maybe Moses was carrying the 15, I mean, the 10 commandments, you know. I don't know. But somehow he knew it was. And, and uh, he's seen uh, Jesus and Moses and Elijah. Now, remember where they just were. And Peter says, man, Lord, it's good that we're here. Can we build some niches for you? Can we build some little coverings for you guys? Because in Peter's mind, he's thinking, look, you got Moses. He's like number one, the author of the law. And you've got Elijah, the number one prophet. He's like number one A. And then we've got Jesus here. We know what he does. He's like number one B. This is cool. Can we build some places to remember this? And while he was still speaking these things, on page 107 of Matthew 17, the Bible says, while Peter was still speaking, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, this is my, what? One, dear son, in whom I take great delight. Listen to him. And when the clouds lifted, Jesus was standing there all alone. God said, look, it's not about the traditions. It's not about the law and the prophets. I mean, they're good. There's nothing wrong with them. In fact, they benefit us. The law teaches us what sin is so we know we need a Savior. And the law helps us understand what the heart of God is so that we can listen to the prophets and repent and turn our hearts to God. But they're not the end all means all. It's not the law and the prophets. It's about my son. God says, you give him your heart and he will change you from the inside out. And you will never, never, never be the same again. You want to get rid of that old nasty habit? Oh, you can try to keep the rules, but you're flail. Give your heart to Jesus. You want to build a strong family? Read all the books you want to, but start by giving your heart to Jesus. You want to know for sure that you'll go to heaven? Don't try to keep all the rules and regulations. You cannot be good enough. You'll never be good enough. Give your heart to Jesus. You want a peace that passes all understanding? Well, go to counseling, but first give your heart to Jesus. You want to to be loved greater than you've ever been loved before? Do you want to be accepted in spite of what has happened in your life? Do you want to be passionate about serving others? Do you want to be filled with forgiveness and the spirit of forgiveness? Then give Jesus your heart. And he will change you from the inside out. And you'll never, never, never be the same again. As I was working on this message this week, my mind went back, because most of you knew I was raised in a good, godly church. We used to sing those hymns over and over again. But they still come back to me. And as I was thinking about them, this message, there was one song that just filled my heart. It's written by Eliza Ewart. It goes like this. Give me thy heart, says the Father above. No gift so precious to him as our love. Softly he whispers, wherever thou art, gratefully trust me and give me thy heart. Give me thy heart, Give me thy heart. Hear the soft whisper wherever thou art. From this dark world he would draw thee apart. Speaking so tenderly, give me thy heart. But that's your decision. What will you decide today? Will you pray with me?